All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you for uh, 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 joining us uh, this afternoon for our event to mark International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, we'll be focusing today on uh, waste and recycling uh, from Nazi Germany to the world around us today. And it's a, um, uh, it's a pleasure, it's a privilege uh, for two fantastic scholars who agreed to uh, uh, join us. Uh, to discuss uh, uh, this uh, interesting, perhaps uh, for some unexpected uh, topic. Um, um, I'll just say a word. Uh, I'm Ross Siegel, by the way. I <laughs> am the director of the MA program in Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Salton uh, University. Um, uh, the event will be based on conversation. There are a number of uh, questions that uh, both Dr. Zimring and Dr. Berg uh, received uh, uh, beforehand. Um, and that will be the basis of the conversation uh, among the three of us. And uh, towards the end, hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A from the audience uh, um, as well for about 20, 25 minutes. Um, so I'll uh, uh, present each of the each of our speakers for today, and we'll jump right into the first uh, question. Uh, so Dr. Carl Timring is professor of sustainability studies at Pratt Institute. He is the author of several books about the history of waste and recycling, including Cash for Your Trash: Scrap Recycling in America, Clean and White: A History of Enri Environmental Racism in the United States, <clears throat> and Aluminium Upcycled. Sustainable Design and Historical Perspective. Dr. Anna Berg is Assistant Professor of History at UPenn. Dr. Berg studies the histories of waste and recycling, film and cities, racism, and genocide. Her research proceeds along a number of parallel tracks connected by a sustained interest in the visual, the spatial, and the material. Her first book, On Screen and Off, Hamburg and the Making of the Nazi City, just came out with the University of Pennsylvania Press. She has also published articles on the history of waste in Nazi Germany, the United States, and South Africa, and currently is working on a new book project that examines the disturbing connections between waste management and genocide in the Third Reich, entitled Empires of Rags and Bones, Waste and War in Nazi Germany. At UPenn, Dr. Berg teaches a rather eclectic range of courses on the history of national socialism, environmental history, and the history of policing. As I said, it's a, it's a great honor. Um, uh, it's a pleasure uh, that you agreed to join us. Thanks to both of you. And uh, I'm very happy that we have a nice uh, uh, audience with us uh, today. So I'll jump right into the first question. Um, please explain how your work on waste and recycling sheds light on issues of racism, white supremacy and state violence in the historical case studies that you examine. How, in other words, does this analytical lens add to and challenge current scholarship on Nazi Germany in US history? And any of you who want to begin, please. Okay, I'll decide. Dr. Berg? <laughs> you're, you're muted. So it seems that if I unmute myself, hello, first of all, thank you for the introduction. I'm sorry to start with technicalities, but it seems that I cannot unmute myself if I mute myself again. So do I need to stay unmuted? So stay, yeah. Okay, and just yeah. be quiet and not fidget? Fine. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, Raz, for the, your generous introduction. Um, I'm really honored and excited to be here with both you, Roz, and, uh, and Carl, and everyone. Thanks for coming. So um, for me to start with this big question that Roz is throwing at, at, at both of us, um, as Roz mentioned, um, my current book project on waste and recycling in Nazi Germany is now, well, I think two thirds written. Um, and I'm really making the argument that Nazi Germany not only pursued a politics of zero waste economics, but that waste management and recycling in particular were actually central to um, the radicalization and the development of genocide, played a fundamental role in kind of 
providing a framework for people to rationalize the logic behind some of the most cruel extractivist um, practices inside the Reich and particularly in the occupied territory. So if I respond to the three parts of the question, um, with respect to racism, obviously, um, it's very much connected. Uh, the sort of um, language that we're all familiar with of Nazis um, referring to Jews as vermin or um, similar kinds of, you know, subhuman categories. Um, I suggest they're not deterministic. We talk about dehumanization a lot. But in fact, if you read the general, general plan for the development of the East or the Green Book or some of the correspondence within the um, Nazi hierarchies, they're actually not talking about how they're going to wipe out all the vermin. They're actually talking about Umsiedlung and using euphemistic language instead of actually being very um, kind of in this sort of rabid way. So from the perpetrator history that I've read, and the kinds of perpetrator testimonies that I've looked at, it seems that um, the Nazis are very much aware that they were murdering people. And so what I think is more at stake here with this kind of, um, the ways in which language and racism figure in here are fantasies of um, cleanliness, of order, and of um, kind of kind of protective categories of protecting against an existential threat. And here, I think the, the kind of um, fantasies about fantasies of purification and, you know, and order are really key in bringing Nazi race thinking and Nazi economic thinking together. And historian Michael, Michael Thad Allen has, has argued convincingly, I would say, that um, it doesn't really make sense to think of um, Nazi racial ideology and economic practice as separate. With respect to white supremacy, my work, I think, takes a slightly different approach. Rather than speaking to white supremacy now, I think my argument would be that the Nazis actually had um, a very long, rich tradition of white supremacist practice that they could look toward and learn from and emulate in various ways and expand on and add their own twists and, and what have you. So I, I would say that Nazi Germany is perhaps a very peculiar example of um, global white supremacy. But I do think it's really important to think about white supremacy not as sort of um, you know, national variants that coalesce, but really as a global system that was only possible to construct in the aftermath of the so-called the, you know, discovery of the new world and the uh, schlepping off of slaves from from Africa and the colonizations uh, uh, of, the, of the Americas. And the extermination of the native peoples that lived here and the subsequent kind of um, carbon capitalism that is still with us today. So I think this sort of longer history is, is important in my work to understand the kind of theoretical and ling linguistic and economical registers that Nazis could look toward as they were, um, you know, expanding uh, their own empire. Um, lastly, with respect to state violence, I think this is where the core of my argument rests. Um, and I think I'm kind of trying to push against the sort of irrational framework that uh, tries to, that looks at Nazi violence as a merely excessive phenomenon. But um, I'm trying to, to show that even though excessive, um, the Nazi genocide actually developed an internal logic, which I would argue was imperial and thus kind of connects with the longer and deeper history of imperialism, extractivism, and settler colonialism. Um, and so, um, but it's further important to me, and I think the, the kind of waste practices inside the Reich make that very clear, is that um, state violence in the Nazi case also required participation and consent. And in my, in my research, I found that, you know, 
questions of order and cleanup and upkeep are the sorts of categories that seem to be apolitical. And people readily exert their, their efforts in you know, doing something that seems to be just a natural and you know, a common good, like cleaning up their mess or sorting their recycling, that sort of thing. While performing and actively participating in the sort of notion of the Nazi people's community. And starting in 1936, um, with the uh, promulgation of the infamous four-year plan, the Nazi regime really embarked on a politics of full-scale total recycling, attempting to harness any and all remainders uh, as a resource to return them to the economy. And this kind of fanaticism escalates even more so during the war. But starting in 1936 and 1937, household recycling, feeding kitchen garbage to hogs, collecting paper and metal scraps, um, Hitler youth dress dressing up in, you know, as metal tubes to kind of make the case to the general public that it's important that you recycle every little bit, even though they didn't use the term, it was salvage or, you know, a, a, a different sort of, um, forms of uh, categorization, but nonetheless, there was an active participation of people thinking of themselves as just cleaning up, being good citizens, being diligent in ways that they didn't often understand as particularly political. And yet this kind of frenzy opened up business opportunities for a whole host of individuals. Um, and corporations. And this again, kind of spirals out of control during the war as the economy becomes subservient to state interest and state violence, pract uh, practices of violence and war. I think we can see again, a sort of merger between um, racial and economic functions. And I think I should maybe stop here. Good, excellent. Yeah, uh, brought up a, a number of important uh, uh, um, issues and kind of the a, a logic and a partic participatory logic also of Nazism and, and the escalation of the, the war and the state violence. So excellent, thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Simring. Uh, oh, it works, it works, fantastic. Yes, yes. I'll do that. Um, th <laughs> thank you, Raz. And um, I'd like to uh, share with Anna, uh, the just profound thanks for being part of this program today. And um, some of the people who came in a little bit early might have heard my excitement on being on this program with Anna, given what you've just heard of her work. And you'll see some of the connections between what she's doing and me, despite the fact that I'm an American historian, there's clearly going to be some overlap in what we're saying. And for this first question, I wanna contextualize my answer with some fairly recent history. And that's the history of the last 30, 35 years of environmental racism. In the year 1992, Benjamin Chavez defined environmental racism as racial discrimination in environmental policymaking and the enforcement of regulations and laws, the deliberate targeting of people of color communities for toxic waste facilities, the official sanctioning of the life-threatening presence of poisons and pollutants in our communities, and the history of excluding people of color from leadership in the environmental movement. Now in 1992, Reverend Chavez is saying this in the context of about 15 years of local communities, mostly in cities, but some in very rural areas like Warren County, North Carolina, where majority African-American communities are being targeted with the siting of toxic wastes. Uh, there's ones in Chicago, there's ones in Houston, uh, and the particularly famous one is in rural North Carolina. Now, oftentimes these very localized actions fail in preventing the siting of toxic waste. What's fairly important about this movement though is after the 1982 Warren County demonstrations, the Congress for Racial Justice which Dr. Chavez commissioned, uh, issued a report, uh, a sociological demographic analysis of the siting of hazardous waste facilities that concluded the most relevant factor in the United States 
in explaining where such facilities, uh, facilities were cited was not the region of the country, nor rural versus urban density, nor even economic class, but whether or not the majority of the residents of that area were enumerated by the US Census of Population as a race other than white. And in this way, this notion of environmental racism as a broad structural inequality in a society becomes understood as a condition that needs to be reacted to against and remediated. Now, as a historian, my contribution to this is to, with a number of other environmental historians, note that environmental racism has a history. And we see this in a variety of works. Uh, Bob Buller, one of the founding sociologists on environmental racism has certainly done a lot about history of the contemporary movement of the 1980s and 90s. Eileen McGurdy's book, Transforming Environmentalism, uh, does a particularly excellent case study of the Warren County protests. My work is a little bit different because along with a few other historians, Dorsita Taylor, Sylvia Hood Washington, and Andrew Hurley, we try to look back at the conditions that led to the movement coming of age in the 1980s, because the conditions that Reverend Chavez spoke about didn't suddenly appear in 1982. They had been part of a long-standing structuring of environmental hazards in majority non-white communities. And in my book, Clean and White, I look at this history as being very dynamic in a couple of ways. One is the environmental hazards change over time as industrial society innovates more and creates new and more monstrous possible toxins. But another aspect of this is that racism itself has a history and racial categorization evolves over time in the United States. Now here is where I'm going to ask Ross to eventually mute me when I speak too long, because a little bit of context I'd like to give, and what I loved about Anna's answer is she gets into the colonial context of race in the new world. And that had been, that uh, creation and structuring of racial identity had been a part of the colonies, the French colonies, the Dutch colonies, the English colonies and the Spanish colonies since European contact. And what I wanna focus on though particularly is that racism in the 19th century in the United States evolves radically, in part due to in the antebellum period, an attempt to justify slavery, despite the fact that with uh, the wave of evangelical conversions in the late 18th and early 19th century, the notion that all humans have souls and are equal before the eyes of God leads to some very troubling moral questions about can you enslave someone who has converted to Christianity, whether that person comes from African heritage or European heritage. The Civil War leads to the emancipation of slaves, but it by no means solves this racial question. And in fact, um, historian Robert Wiebe in 1967 characterizes the very turbulent period between the 1870s and the 1920s as a search for order in the nation's society. Abolition of slavery is part of these changes. Uh, and then the question of what is the political, economic, and social context for freed Black Americans? But it's not the only one. Industrialization is intensified during this period. Related to that, urbanization has increased. And with industrialization and urbanization, new concerns about sanitation become to, uh, at the forefront of American society. This is also true in Europe as well, that there are new worries about sanitation. With more dense cities, you get cholera, yellow fever, scarlet fever, influenza, and all sorts of other epidemics that can kill hundreds or even thousands of people within a week. Um, and so one of the parts of the search for order are cities attempting to rationalize and manage those hazardous materials that might cause epidemic disease. Um, related to this, and this is the last thing I'll say for this particular part of our conversation, uh, 
new sanitary industries and lines of work emerge that become fairly large in this period. Uh, and this uh, goes, this includes street cleaning, garbage collection, laundry work, janitorial work, and scrap recycling. The one thing I'll say right now is that between the US Civil War and the 1920s, all of these occupations have different demographic characteristics. The one important thing about them all, all of the majority of people who are working in these various waste handling occupations were enumerated as something other than white in terms of their racial categories. A lot of black people doing janitorial and laundry work, Chinese men doing laundry work. And then this is one of the other important things that will relate to some of our other conversation. Uh, at the turn of the century, we can make a real argument that Jews in the United States are not seen as white people. Uh, the restrictions facing Jews in public accommodations, housing markets, uh, ed education, and also jobs is very, very limited. And one of the reasons that I became particularly fascinated in this environmental racism question that I've been talking about is my first book is a history of the scrap recycling industry. It is impossible to tell the story of scrap recycling in the United States without talking about how much it is part of the American Jewish experience, both in terms of the majority of firms that were selling scrap metal in the 1920s and 1930s were owned by either Jewish first generation immigrants or the children or grandchildren of those immigrants. But also for many, many Jewish Americans, myself included, um, it is not unusual for us to have an ancestor at the very least who has participated in the scrap industry in some way. Some are wild successes, many were failures or were just struggling to get along, but work in handling waste was a significant part of the uh, Jewish experience during the era of mass migration and actually for several decades after that. So thinking about waste as it relates to race shapes a lot of what we understand about how waste is handled in the US, but it also gives us an insight into what was open to, what the opportunities were and what the dangers were to people who have not been considered white in this society. And perhaps there I should stop now so we can get to the next portion of the discussion. Good, excellent. Thank you very much. And you know, I'm so happy that already now we're starting to see the significance of this discussion, right? Of, uh, of, of really learning in this day, but every day really of the year, but in this day specifically about the significance of why we should think about the Holocaust, about Nazism. How is it relevant to the world around us? How is it tied to you know, a larger history before Nazism and all the way until our world. So with that, I'll jump into the second question. Uh, we know of various links between Nazi Germany and the US, direct links uh, of various sorts, thanks to legal scholar uh, James Whitman, for example, we know that the Nazis modeled to some extent the Nuremberg laws on US race laws. So the question is, have you found instances or evidence uh, of links between these histories and your own research, from your own lens of ways to recycling. Um, Anna. Yeah, so thanks for this question, Raz. I mean, there are multiple links and perhaps none in my work are quite as striking as the sort of direct boring that Whitman describes in terms of the legal apparatus, because the US really was kind of the, first, the, the most developed existing racial state at the time that the Nazis uh, tried to build their own. Um, so I think the, the connections in, in my work are a little more subtle. And I think here the, I would stress again, kind of the, the sort of um, imperial model, the sense that informed Nazi ideologues that Germany was a a country without space, without resources, and that the only uh, way to kind of achieve a, 
a dominant status or the dominant status in terms of geopolitical position was to build an empire. And they looked to the US, but not just the US, they looked also towards Great Britain um, and the Soviet Union. So the sort of merger of um, territory to be exploited, resources to be extracted, lies at the core of why this recycling regime develops in the first place. Because until that realization has come to pass, until space has been accumulated and land has been grabbed, until then, basically the Nazis need to spin gold out of straw, at least in their own minds, right? And so in that sense, the kind of um, justifications that um, are written into the various um, policies and plans for expansion often, very often look to the United States specifically and name the United States specifically. In addition, when uh, faced with criticism uh, about the treatment of Jews in the early 30s, I mean, the New York Times is full of, um, you know, articles calling out the violence that is happening in Germany in the immediate aftermath of the Nazi assumption of power. Um, talking about propaganda, the, you know, how freedom of speech is being eliminated, how Jews are be, be, being beaten in the streets. And Hitler's reaction really was that, you know, Roosevelt shouldn't assume to be able to tell him what to do with his Jews um, because Hitler wouldn't presume to tell Roosevelt what to do with his blacks. And so that, those, is the kind of, those are the kinds of um, references that we can see where the Germans were acutely aware um, of the racial discourse in the United States, of the power of race, and obviously the entire history of racial thinking did not, uh, the Nazis didn't have to invent this, right? I, I think there they really go back to um, the, the, the thinkers that also shaped um, the American constitution. The Enlightenment thinkers, I think, shaped uh, the, the trajectory of the entire Western world. Um, and that I think becomes uh, very clear with the crystallization of what is called racial anti-Semitism at the end of the 19th century that really kind of maps ra racial, racial science. And I'm not using science in quotation marks because I do not want to suggest that scientists at the time didn't think that they were doing real science. That was the best of the, that science had to offer at the time. And that's disturbing, I think, in and of itself, right? But they thought that, that, that they're, they're cutting edge and that is a sort of international collabor collaborative effort, I think, that shaped and, and continues to shape the world today. So racial anti-Semitism sort of maps onto this. The problem, you might ask, what is, you know, the Jews didn't have a color. And I think that's sort of the, the particular aspect in which Hitler faced a certain kind of conundrum and also that heightened the fears, the paranoia of, this, of the Nazi security apparatus, because unlike in the United States, race was not visible when it came to Jews. And so I think there are, there are attempts obviously to render Jews visible. And we don't actually get to that point in, in the most crudest form until September of 1941, when the Nazis make it mandatory for Jews to wear the yellow star on their um, outer garments. Uh, and so I think here we can, we can kind of see how important it, visibility was. And I wanna kind of draw to the connections in terms of the moment at which this is happening, racial anti-Semitism is born at the moment of the height of imperial expansion um, of European experience expansion in Africa. It is more overborne at a moment when we have um, a mass uh, introduction of new technologies um, such as photography and film, kind of create a different mass market so that being able to see things, to render things vis visually becomes a form of evidence that is imbued with a, a, a very powerful message and, and um, what do I say, like it, it's simply seen as better, more objective evidence than, uh, than other forms of evidence in the past. And at the same time, dangerous in that it might corrupt 
the, the minds of the young and so on and so forth. But I think the, this is not coincidental that at a moment when evidence, the, the, the ability to render evidence visually in, in a mass produced form, um, the visibility of difference becomes also more important. And obviously in, in, the, in the German case, uh, with respect to um, making Jews visible, the Nazi scientists tried very hard to find all sorts of biological um, linkages and genetic proof and what have you for their racial um, theories and presumptions. Nonetheless, they resorted to visualizations characterizations, exaggerations uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that resembles the kind of phrenology and um, criminology of the 19th century. And I think there are the kinds of connections that I would say are not particularly perhaps with respect to the US, but are more generally shared amongst the Western, uh, amongst the Western world and the sort of imperial context obviously is really important. One last thing on this particular point. Um, obviously, the, the kinds of practices, I mean, we talked, I, I liked when, when Carl mentioned um, the kind of rubbish spaces um, of urban congestion that also are a characteristic of the late 19th century. But is striking to me is that in their racist practice, the Nazis actually seem to be manufacturing the evidence for their theories by creating rubbish spaces and schedules in camps with making no provisions for people. They're creating um, the visual evidence for their theories of um, degeneration and subhuman status and so on and so forth. And again, try to render those in film. And I think here are the um, you know, examples of the various um, footage taken in the ghettos in Poland. I think the, uh, Hozonski is a film unfinished, does a masterful job of kind of putting th that history um, in context and questioning uh, the, 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 the images that the Nazis produced. So, um, I'm going to stop here. I, otherwise, I, I'll just get from one thing into the next. <laughs> Good. Very, you know, again, you're, uh, as in your uh, uh, previous uh, uh, responses, uh, you also emphasize the links between the US and Nazi Germany, but also in a global perspective, right? So we're talking really about uh, issues that have global dimensions uh, and deep histories. Uh, please, Carl. Um, delighted. And, uh, I really like where this conversation is going because it relates also to, in the United States, the populism of the late 19th century is incredibly anti-urban. At the same time, it's anti-immigrant and anti-Black. And this is already a time that you start seeing the roots of segregation in urban areas and the notion of sundown towns and rural areas where Black Americans can't physically go without getting beaten or killed. Um, and that relates to, um, Again, I will share the sentiment that James Whitman's work is going to be a lot more explicit than the subtle work I'm about to present, though I will make one explicit connection in a few minutes, which could actually lead to some more talk uh, in terms of the overlap of our research. Um, certainly one dimension of Nazi racial ideology that's linked to the American experience is the equating of racial purity with environmental purity. The notion of Jews as vermin means there can be a clean environment free of these people who are unwanted. Uh, the elimination of dirt, as uh, uh, Mary Douglas has argued in Purity and Danger, is about exercises of power. And those can very much have negative effects on people who are classified as dirt or dirty um, and what that could mean. And obviously, uh, the case of Nazi Germany is this in its most extreme example, but we see this replicated in modern society over and over again. By the time Nazi propaganda posters equated Jews with vermin making claims such as Jews are lice, they cause typhus, uh, equating both Southern and Eastern European immigrants 
as well as African Americans with epidemic diseases have been happening in American literature, advertisements, legislation, and even sociological academic texts for several decades. Now, by the time Hitler comes to power, um, one of the aspects of this that's I think important is as Peter Stearns has talked about, one of the examples of American empire is the exporting of mass culture from the US to the rest of the world. And Birth of a Nation, the big blockbuster movie at the end of the teens, which is, uh, and I'm going to say this, not this is not flip, truly a love letter to the Ku Klux Klan as the redeemers of American honor, particularly white women's sexual honor against the scourge of free blacks. That's a huge hit film. It gets uh, brought overseas. And that would be something that people in Germany would be aware of. They would also likely be aware of the way soaps and cleansers were marketed in the United States. And I talk about this a bit in my book, Clean and White, but the notion of ivory soap being 99 and three quarter percent pure white soap um, is a fairly gentle version of a very racialized argument about hygiene. Uh, and that is in the marketing from many different soap and cleanser companies, there would be the sentiment that non-white skin, and here I'm not just saying black skin, but the skin of Middle Eastern swarthy people, Eastern European swarthy people, Chinese, Asian people, uh, Native Americans with so-called red skin was somehow visually a representation of something less than clean. And the way this gets articulated is in ads where say a blonde blue eyed child will talk to a black with black hair and brown eyed child and say, why doesn't your mother wash you with fairy soap? Or a white man is taking a bar of lout soap and washing a black child white and blonde and blue eyed with this soap. And similar types of marketing go on for over 40 years um, into the 1920s. And they're in magazines, they're in leaflets, they're in a lot of different places. But that's not the more explicit link that I wanna make. The explicit link I wanna make is one that actually resonates a lot with what Anna says about what recycling in Germany actually is and is actually trying to do. And for that, we need to talk about Henry Ford. Henry Ford is very famous for a couple of things. One is he's one of the fathers of modern industry and modern life. Um, and here, when I go down to Philadelphia, I often am talking with historians of technology at Penn. And one of the famous ones who's now deceased is Thomas Park Hughes, who always makes us say that, you know, there aren't no one great inventor man. Everyone's in a context, everyone's in a system. And certainly Henry Ford is part of a much larger system of rationalizing forces to improve production and expand industrial capacity. And Ford really was um, true, uh, an icon of efficiency, the notion of the assembly line and having three eight hour shifts so that the factory could be going 24 hours a day to churn out all of the Model Ts they want to sell around the world. That's something that Adolf Hitler is on record for admiring. But the other reason why um, Henry Ford's important for this conversation is he was perhaps in the United States, the most effective propagator in the early 20th century of anti-Semitism. And specifically, he published a newspaper called the Dearborn Independent. Dearborn, essentially a Ford uh, factory town on the outskirts of Detroit. Um, and he would have essays written by his secretary uh, about say, how the historic basis of Jewish imperialism. Jewish jazz becomes our national music, Jewish supremacy in motion picture world. And so many essays about Jews and the worldwide banking conspiracy, many of which drew from the protocols of the elders of Zion. 
Now, what's important here is these essays weren't just printed in the Dearborn Independent. Ford collected four volumes of these essays and put them out as open source, no copyright books. The first of which, The International Jew, was published in the year 1920, sold over 200,000 copies in two years, was translated into German, and Adolf Hitler kept copies of this book in his office. In 1931, Hitler told a visiting Detroit news reporter that, quote, I regard Henry Ford as my inspiration. Now, to the extent this is about amassing industrial capacity versus anti-Semitism is in many ways possibly a false question. Because if we look at this through the framework of what Anna's been arguing, that these in fact are part of the same rationalization of the world that Hitler is trying to do. And again, to go back to Thomas Park Hughes, there's no one great man history. Lest we say that Ford is this unusual individual, he was a Michigan farm boy. He was coming of age when the Know Nothings and the Ku Klux Klan are both rising in protest against these fears of immigration, of free Blacks, and of epi epidemic disease that I talked about at the first beginning of our conversation. Ford is a product of this, and from his worldview, he disseminates this especially virulent view of anti-Semitism. At the same time, he's working to, in his River Rouge plant, trying to take every bit of scrap metal off the factory floor and recycle it. Um, one of the ironies for me is because the scrap industry was so dominated by Jews, and I've not seen anything where he's directly talking about this, Ford Motor Company had to do business with Jewish owned Ferris scrap companies in order to get the volume of metal that Henry Ford would want to keep his assembly lines going. The last thing I'll say about this is Ford actually in the 1920s tries to create his own independent scrap uh, reviewing, purchasing and processing company. And that single-handedly leads to the existing scrap businesses of the day creating a trade association called the Institute for Scrap Iron and Steel, which after some mergers and renaming becomes the Institute for Scrap Recycling Industries, which is the leading voice of the recycling industry today. So in some ways, Ford's antipathy towards the scrap industry, which is run by Jews, shaped the modern recycling industry in the United States. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Um... Some very uh, indeed disturbing uh, connections we're we're seeing, and you know again between Nazi Germany and uh, and the U.S., but also again in a broader global kind of we, we can say part of the process of the making uh, uh, of the modern world or the ordering of the world, right? To use that uh, word, how do you put things in order? How do you make sure that they're clean, that they're... Um, so with that, I turn to my uh, <clears throat> third and last question. Um, uh, and I'll be summarizing a bit of what you said so far and then turning to the question itself just for a, a minute or two. So uh, Carl, uh, looking through the, the prism of uh, dirt and the constructions of uh, what's clean, quote unquote, you've discussed how those targeted by white supremacy in the US could over time come to regard themselves and be regarded by others as white, quote unquote. Right? Jews, Jews in the US after World War II are a particularly interesting case especially, of course, considering uh, the Holocaust. And uh, your work demonstrates how broad social involvements and large-scale waste management, this participatory uh, atmosphere, right, and recycling projects function to support racist and violent states, even as they head clearly towards collapse, including now environmental, in our world, environmental collapse that threatens everyone, even as some remain significantly of course, more vulnerable than others. So my, my question 
in relation to that is actually about shifting the focus from the perpetrators to those who face the perpetrators, the victims, is about resistance. Uh, what kinds of resistance to systems of white supremacy and racism did you find in your research? And how and to what extent do groups resist assimilation into a white supremacist system that had formerly targeted them for exclusion? And what kinds of collaborations between groups facing white supremacy emerge? And how thinking about the implications of both of your works for our very fast changing reality, do people who engage in resistance today navigate the challenges of this addressing problems that are on the one hand specific to the US, its history, its struggle for equality, justice and reparations, but on the other hand, very much part of what you called in a recent article and marvelously rubbished world, right? So resistance, the victim's perspectives, the, you know, uh, uh, please, Anne. Oof. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's the tough one that I was dreading. Um, it's really difficult because, uh, in, and I talk with my students about this all the time. When we talk about resistance, we have some, we have to first, I think, clarify what we mean by resistance. Does resistance need to be successful yeah. in order for it to count as resistance? Because uh, in my view, obviously that is not the case. Um, and as historians like Carl and I who work on systemic problems, structural forms of oppression, um, resistance almost always fails. And it's really kind of a, 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 such an imbalance between a system on the one hand and an individual resisting the system on the other um, that, that is by definition lopsided and Gramsci's notions of hegemony, obviously I'm not gonna get into those, but I think it's important to un for understanding what resistance can be and can mean in these various contexts and um, both in the past and in the present. What is more, the sources that I, study, they're perpetrator sources. Almost, we do have survivor testimony and I work with those very closely and rely on them uh, quite heavily. But at the same time, the perspective is very different from a, an individual taking notes or writing a memoir after um, the, the war um, and the Holocaust on their, on their personal experience than from the planners and memoranda that are being shared within the administration. So again, even if there is in terms of volume, uh, even if there were in terms of volume of parity of sources, in terms of the kinds of sources that survive, there are very different kinds of sources. And so it's very difficult um, to, to talk about resistance that is not, that are not the sort of, uh, incidents like the Warsaw Ghetto uprising uh, and, and incidents of re resistance that we all know very, very much about, but rather the sort of forms of everyday resistance are the forms that I'm most interested in. To what extent is um, taking notes, keeping a diary, um, sharing bread, an act of resistance. And I do think in my work, I find a lot of that sort of resistance when I look at the records, um, even when I look at the, the records that are being kept from uh, the perspective of the perpetrators. So where there are instances of indication of intent to survive, of intent to not participate in these structures that are impossible to escape from. And so those forms of resistance are the ones that I see, but obviously in terms of the, the big picture, they, they, they seem to only underscore the overpowering structures of systemic oppress, oppression in the face of which, and any form of resistance, um, ends up being defeated and often leads to more excessive retaliation and more violence. And so um, that is one reason why 
why I often explain to my students that the Holocaust is perhaps not the best historical example to take our lessons from for thinking about how to operate in the present. But under conditions that are so extreme, um, the, the, the rooms for the, the room for maneuver, the room for individual action become in, infinitely small. And I think we are in a place right now where that is not the case. And if we use the Holocaust as a benchmark, as that sort of suggests at what point of resistance should have taken place and not by the victims, but by the surrounding um, actors, the geopolitical actors, um, and by the most importantly, by the Germans themselves to, to their own government, to, the, to themselves. Um, if we take the Holocaust as a benchmark for when people need to act, then I think everybody's off the hook all the time. And I think that's a problem. Uh, the, that's why I, I think the Holocaust is sometimes really difficult to use for those kinds of lessons because it really underscores the overpowering um, nature of systemic oppression when it is fully formed and uh, flexing is, its muscles in, in this particular way. So for, for resistance today, I think there are, there are, two, there, there are two answers that I would have. Um, on the one hand, I think it is really important that we really clearly articulate and describe the complicated notion and historical construction of what we have come to accept as order. And to continue to question, what does it mean to live in an ordered or orderly, clean society? And uh, that is, I think, what abolitionists call, you know, getting rid of the cob inside your head. <laughs> it's sort of, to, to, to not think in terms of punishment and carcerality, to not think in terms of order as something that is artificially produced and enforced by an agent that has power to, inf to, to, to wield violence legitimately, but to think, of, um, to think of where this construction of order comes from and to you know, call it out, contextualize it, historicize it, Basically that gets us to sort of understanding the system of white supremacy that we live in and it's many iterations and manifestations across time and space. But obviously historians and other uh, scholars have done this for a very long time. <laughs> and somehow the system seems to uh, not care so much about what we have to say about it. <laughs> and so I think uh, there needs to be a different answer to this question that as a historian, perhaps I can't answer, but as an activist, I can. And that is the kind of work I think that we need to do inside our own communities, where I think there we can look for some inspiration from um, people inside Nazi concentration camp, inside death camps in, in Poland, who actually continued to work with other people and uh, extend a, a helping hand. Um, and I think in, in activist circles, we understand the big picture and the structural complexities, but nonetheless, it is working at the local level with the people in your community um, that allows for small wins, simple gains that are relational rather than necessarily structural, but equally important, I would say. But I realize how unsatisfactory an answer that is. So um, I apologize. I wish I had a better one. No, not at all. And you raised actually very, very important points in my view. First of all, you know, uh, when, how do we need to think about resistance in terms of when it happens, when should it happen, right? How we understand actually what resistance is, right? Uh, in view of this historical idea of, you know, the, the, the system of white supremacy in which we live indeed, uh, and how we think about order, and then how we think about addressing problems actually through the very system that is the problem itself, right? So all these things are very important, including the kind of intersection of uh, uh, scholar, historian, activist that you presented that I appreciate. 
uh, raging. Uh, Carl, please. Um, I, I'll second that and just say that Anna has just wonderfully articulated why it's so important to have history in the present moment. And I'll say this in I, the comments before uh, we actually started recording. Uh, one of the reasons we're under such fire in our discipline right now is how much what we do and the stories we present matter and the arguments about history. And one of the things I'll add to this uh, before I actually end at the same point I started our discussion with is thinking through this notion of race as something that itself has a history. Um, and here I'm very much in the debt of Nell Irvin Painter uh, for thinking about whiteness has a history. David Rediger before her, Bell Hooks, who we just lost, certainly talked about this at great length. And one of the aspects of the history of whiteness that I think is important is that the model of race that I presented in which Southern and European uh, whites aren't actually white, including Jews, including Italians, um, including Slavs, for a large portion of the United States history. Well, whiteness evolves in the 1940s, and that's evident in US federal policy. In 1940, the Immigration and Nationalization, Naturalization Service designated European immigrants race as white on application forms for the first time instead of racial categories like Jewish, Slovenian, et cetera. Uh, historian Eric Goldstein cited public opinion polls carried out just after the war that showed Americans had far less of a tendency to identify Jews as a race rather than as, quote, white ethnics. Um, that, um, and that's a major change from before the war. And certainly the Holocaust has a lot to do with that. But the thing is, it's not just Jews. It's also Italians. It's also Slavs who are assimilating into white identity in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Not all at once and not universally, there's still very clear discriminations going on, but the public accommodations available to American Jews by the time I'm born in 1969 are immensely different than they were when my father was born in 1942, including where one could go to school, who one could marry fairly easily, uh, and also the types of jobs people could do. I wanted to end with that particular part because when we talk about Jews in waste handling work, there's a transition out of waste as assimilated Jews can be in suburbs, at the nice schools, and then get into nicer jobs. Obviously one of the problems with waste work is it can be very hazardous. It can expose you to all sorts of illness and injury. And one thing a lot of veteran scrap dealers are noting as early as the 1960s, is it becomes for the successful scrap dealers, difficult to have their children take over the family business. Instead, they become doctors, they become lawyers, they get MBAs, they go into a variety of white collar occupations. Occasionally with the very large firms, they might be the president of the scrap in, uh, company, but they may not be handling the wastes. Increasingly the burdens of that work fall between 1950 and the end of the century on African-Americans, Mexican-Americans, Puerto Ricans, and toward the very end of the period, Pacific Islanders and Asians who uh, come into the scrapyards. So one of the answers to Raza's question is there is assimilation into white identity, which could lead to foisting the burdens of systematic racism on those who don't have it. But that's not the only answer. Because one thing certainly that we really should talk about on Holocaust Remembrance Day is the central role that American Jews have played in the civil rights struggle of this country. Many activist Jews, including the rabbi who bar mitzvahed me, worked alongside African-American uh, uh, clergy in trying to desegregate both the South as well as urban North and cities such as my hometown of Chicago, still a highly racially segregated city. And the last thing I'll say about that as it relates to waste uh, has to do with um, 
actually the last uh, holiday that we just uh, memorialized, which is MLK's birthday. Martin Luther King died in Memphis, uh, which is something fairly commonly known in American history. What's not talked about as much is that he died. He, the reason he was in Memphis is he was supporting a strike of sanitation workers. And it very clearly followed from his earlier work because by 1968, the people who were collecting garbage on the streets of Memphis were almost uniformly black men, many recruited from the cotton fields of Northern Mississippi. And the conditions they were subject to were dehumanizing and dangerous. And after two men, Robert Walker and Echo Cole were crushed to death on the back of a, a garbage truck. Um, they went out on strike. Dr. King said the movement lives or dies in Memphis and came to support this movement. Um, and I wanted to talk about this a little bit because the, what that strike is mostly known for is the assassination of Dr. King. But in the wake of his assassination, the strikers won a contract with the city of Memphis that included better wages and better working conditions, safer working conditions. Similarly, racialized departments of sanitation in many other cities from Atlanta to Seattle over the next five years, won collective bargaining agreements that helped make their work somewhat less dangerous. It may not be a revolution that completely eradicates this notion of environmental racism, which doesn't even get called that until after this wave of unionizing in the early late 60s and early 70s. But that gives an idea of how there can be alliances and there were rabbis in Memphis marching alongside the garbage workers and along Dr. King in 1968. And thinking through where there might be these shared burdens where even if we have assimilated into a lot of the comforts of white society, and I say this as a university professor, my great grandfather was a scrap peddler. Um, I never had to do such things. And I recognize now when I put paper in my recycling bin in my office, it's collected by a woman who is Mexican-American, put into a dumpster where it's collected by Dominicans who then go take the paper to a processing facility in Brooklyn, where just a few years ago, a teenage boy who was working there, Dominican-American, was crushed to death just like those Memphis uh, garbage workers were crushed to death in 1968. To what extent is my role in our larger systems of production, consumption, and disposal feeding into the dangers facing current day waste workers? I gave a specific example here, but over the last two years, I think we also have a lot of other examples who have been essential workers during the coronavirus pandemic who have been cleaning up our houses, our laundry, our hospitals, who is being exposed to this very dangerous work, to what extent is this racialized? When we talk about racial equity, there's a whole host of systemic issues we have to be concerned about, including the mass incarceration that is a specialty of the American state as over the last 40 years. Um, but also about the working conditions and the work structures of occupation that have been racialized in this country from the emergence of these occupations and still very much are there today. So I'd argue as we think about resistance, this is a very important thing to think about. Who's doing the dirty work in American society and in industrial society throughout the world? How much is what we're disposing of in the United States affecting not only our neighbors and our fellow uh, citizens in the United States, but people all around the world as there's a global waste trade as well? There aren't easy answers to this question, but thinking about the question, I argue, is very important if we're thinking about a more just future. Thank you. I mean, 
from our campuses indeed, which is so important because we're, you know, in a university uh, and the university system, which, you know, arguably suffers from all the things that we've been discussing uh, uh, in the last uh, hour and a bit. Um, we have, uh, I wanna uh, uh, take some questions or uh, comments uh, uh, in the last uh, uh, 20, 25 uh, minutes that we have, and we might go over if, if you know, if we me. see that, that the discussion is flowing well, if both of you can, of course. Uh, um, but let's start with uh, 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 Dr. Matt Hone, uh, who I think you have a, a comment, uh, Matt, you can un unmute and, and uh, go ahead. Okay, okay, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay, yeah, I was just uh, trying to put everything together. I mean, first of all, great presentations. And I was trying to put everything together with uh, in the context of Latin America, where I'm living in right now in Mexico. And, and a couple of things that uh, came to mind. One was when Roz was talking about resistance to um, resistors to, uh, against these environmental injustices. Um, it is so dangerous to be a resistor here in Latin America. I think Honduras recently was named the most dangerous place in the world to be an environmentalist. And in Mexico is dangerous where I am right now in El Salvador and things like that. And it seems like the people here are being attacked by, from a two pronged approach. You have this idea of colonialism that, that is uh, embraced by the elites, but you also have the exploitation of international companies that are coming down here and uh, and also um, um, exploiting uh, you know the lands and 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 uh, and poisoning uh, water sources like international mining companies and and it just uh, I just wanted to, to to make that comment and and it's uh, you know it's a uh, and then just to relate it to this form of environmental racism that is happening right here. Thank you, Matt. Uh... Any responses or? Oh, I'll just add one very quick thing. Um, Sarah Hill, the historian from uh, Western Michigan University, uh, did a lot of really good work about the illegal smuggling uh, in the 1990s of automobile batteries across the Rio Grande to be processed in Mexico. And this actually gets into the international aspects of this, where battery acid and lead uh, are um, uh, not only in the environment as they're being taken apart, but also in the bodies of the workers doing it. So in this way, we can think of the international dimension of the waste trade having particular burns on Mexicans. Yeah, I would add to that, that in general, in the Western world, our wastes are not recycled in our own countries. For the most part, we're shipping our junk elsewhere. Um, and uh, the, the, you know, the people who are congratulating themselves for separating uh, their trash at the source are actually in many ways contributing to, to a continuing exacerbation of a problem that we yeah. can feel good about throwing our um, whatever garbage into the respective receptacle and not have to worry about what happens to it after, but it's actually continuing to pollute the bodies of, of people who are doing that dirty labor. And throughout our discussion, I think what's become clear is that proximity to waste code substatus. Mm -hmm. And um, I think in many ways, recycling is not a progressive endeavor. It is actually a conservative mechanism to preserve the system. And we see this particular, I think, in the international dimension of kind of shipping garbage elsewhere, put, putting waste with unwanted people, um, and enforcing a uh, an economic hierarchy that forces the dirty labor on people who have no power. The one thing I'll add to that, which I fully agree with, is it's fascinating to me as a historian of recycling, how it has become associated with environmental morality in a way that is the inverse of what it had been up until the late 1960s. And Regardless of that, this is one ahistorical thing I can say about recycling. It doesn't exist to save the planet or to reduce global warming. The reason recycling is effective at anything at all is that it exists to give affordable raw materials to the endless maw of mass production. So for things like metals, 
there's always going to be a lot of successful metal recycling, whether it's aluminum, whether it's steel. Today, we put all this plastic in recycling bins. There's never demand for because, frankly, it's a lot easier to make new plastics out of petroleum than to remelt and process plastics. So uh, one of the problems with recycling being this moral act is this notion of what Samantha McBride and others call wish cycling. You put in the recycling bin, you're wishing it's actually going to get recycled. Well, that's going to landfill or uh, incinerators anyway. But even the stuff that is getting recycled, as I said, what's the purpose of this? Is this actually reducing environmental degradation? Uh, the story is a lot more complicated than that. And looking at the history of how people and societies have treated recycling and those who recycle, can give us a really open idea of how well modern industrial production and a modern American uh, industrial society is and is not working for a sustainable future. Because I'm a professor of sustainability studies and from this discussion you can hear, uh, what we're doing is not sustainable whatsoever. And the danger of calling something like recycling sustainable is putting a Band-Aid on an open gaping wound. Thank you. I'll just add, you know, I think that uh, uh, your uh, two comments that you made, Matt, also the dangers, the acute life-threatening dangers that environmental activists uh, uh, face in Latin America and other places around the world. That's a very important issue. And also the appropriation of the discourse of colonialism and anti-colonialism, right, in places like Mexico, you will also see it very effectively in India and other places. Like, that's also something that's part of this uh, story to consider. Please, Carl. Um, I just I got a direct message uh, from Christina Morris, which is uh, about, is this true across the border only with plastics? I'm glad for this question because um, as Ross noted, I wrote a book on aluminum upcycling. Uh, and one of the reasons I did that is a lot of engineers talk about aluminum as this material of mass production that's a sustainable material of mass production. And one of the arguments for that is that for a variety of economic reasons, uh, companies prefer to recycle aluminum rather than mining virgin bauxite and turning into aluminum, not because necessarily they care about the environment because it's just much cheaper for them to do this. So over two thirds of all the aluminum produced since the beginning of the 20th century are recycled. That's about as close to a closed loop for any material of mass production as you can imagine. And we've successfully recycled not just old Coke cans into new Coke cans, but into F-150 trucks, airplanes, guitars, furniture, all these really durable uh, goods. Those are all made out of essentially the scrap heap. And that sounds like a really happy narrative until you realize that since the public systems of collecting, oh, I should just say one other thing. Um, the vast majority of aluminum produced within the United States today is recycled. Um, so um, recycling markets in this country have been working very effectively. At the same time though, since we started uh, deposit laws in states and curbside collection of recycling, where the public sector has been involved, Bauxite mining has tripled in the world because when we make these items that we love, whether they're disposable cans or Ford F-150s, the economy continues to expand. So, oh, let's get more Ford F-150s. And so making things even out of recycled materials, it's great that we can make them out of recycled materials, but if there's so much demand, not just in the US, but worldwide, we have to mine more materials in order to satisfy the demand. So one of my arguments, because I'm at a design school, if we're gonna think about sustainability and design, it, for example, for a car, maybe a Ford F-150 or a Tesla is not the most sustainable automobile design we could have. My argument would be something more like Zipcar. It's a ride sharing device. You can rent a car for a couple of hours. The reason why is regardless of how the car is made, instead of producing 100 cars for 100 consumers and all that goes into the material, the labor, the energy, the water, what have you, you can 
have three cars for 100 people. And there are aspects of the sharing economy which uh, are somewhat successful. The question is, can we make this the way that industrial society is actually going to be organized when industrial capitalism really demands expanding the markets? Expanded markets and sustainable resource use are inherently contradictory, whether it's metals, papers, glass, or again, this most problematic issue of plastics. So sorry if I diverted us a little bit, but this relates to some of the justice issues involving waste and recycling that we've been talking about. Absolutely, and uh, you know, I, I'm, I think this is such an important discussion to have always, but particularly, right, again, on this day, particularly in relation to thinking about Nazism, about Nazi Germany, the Holocaust, right, and waste and recycling, and order and modern ideas and industrialization and capitalist economy and expansion, right? And all these ideas that are associated with it, I think it really sheds light, uh, um, you know, uh, on, on our ethics here, right? As, as professors, as scholars, as people in society, right? You know, as you said, Anne, if, if, if recycling is a conservative endeavor, right? If we are, you know, uh, 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 continuously propping up the system, what does that mean? Right? What should we do differently? How should we do it? What kind of collaboration alliances should be formed and so on and so forth? What questions should we ask? How should we be disturbed rather than feeling happy that we're participating in recycling, right? At the very least. Um, well, I mean, uh, there is the, the, the example that Carl was talking about earlier about um, in 1968, 1969, um, when US cities were basically drowning in their own stink because the sanitation workers were going on strike. I mean, there's also, they also put on display the mm -hmm. power of garbage, yeah. of disrupting this order and actually refusing to do the dirty work. And to me, the focus on waste labor is so important because even in a situation like, you know, successful recycling or near successful recycling as aluminum recycling, the labor, I mean, I can give you an example from Nazi Germany. They also recycled aluminum and particularly used the tin cans that contained Wehrmacht uh, army provisions brought them back to concentration camps inside the, inside the Reich and affixed them to the soles of wooden shoes in order to keep the soles thinner and make the shoes more durable and had prisoners test march the shoes on specifically designed tracks to durability tests under conditions that's supposed to mimic um, the conditions that uh, the shoes would have to face in forced labor details outside the camps. And so there, if, if you're thinking about the kind of logic that is obviously in this particular case, extreme and cruel and, and what have you, the kind of work that people do today, particularly when we talk about plastic recycling, it actually seeps into people's bodies. And the, dis, the, the kinds of you know, um, hormonal, hormonal mimicry that plastic is able to do is fundamentally changing human biology. Uh, it's really a, a terrible thing to sort of think about, and it's not disconnected. So I think the the, the fantasies about recycling um, erase the kind of disruptive power that gar garbage and waste can also have. And I think in the 60s, people have recognized this and have put down their, their tools and literally laid waste to American cities. Perfectly stated, laid waste. I love it. Other questions from uh, our uh, Christina, Dr. Christina Morris, please. You can unmute and. Okay. All right. Thanks. This was such an interesting presentation. And going into it, I was like, huh, I wonder what recycling has to do with Nazis. And um, <laughs> I knew that I was going to be like enlightened. Um, and so I. I I mean, plastic is terrible and for a million reasons. And they're, they're getting rid of the plastic bags, right? And like recycling and all that. So what is the most ethical choice then, right? Is it oat milk? Is it almond milk? Is it, <laughs> is it like paper? Is it glass, right? Like, like how should we be getting our stuff? Because like we should all use less stuff but we still need some stuff. <laughs> 
Do, do, do you want me to respond or do you want to go, Carl? Uh, how about you go first? Because I'll, I'll go afterwards and give a couple of my personal anecdotes. So, see, I think that's where I think the Nazi case is really helpful because the ideological apparatus is so clearly visible, right? And beyond dispute. And also, we do not fall into the same trap of asking individuals to be in the position of changing the system, yeah. right? Whereas in our own context, we have um, a systemic apparatus, global capitalist, white supremacy, add patriarchy in the mix. I mean, there are multiple other um, you know, sy systemic aspects to this, but we cannot opt out of capitalism. And to frame the question in a, in a way that puts the onus on the individual actually helps to perpetuate the system. Yeah. If you don't eat meat or recycle or what have you, you're actually putting the burden on you without thinking about how structural changes need to be implemented, which individualism, I think, is a key component um, in this whole complex of problems. As long as we think of problems as structural and systemic, but responsibility as individual, we are impossible to solve this conundrum and will continuously create mental health crises for each and every one of us mm -hmm. <laughs> and a crisis of responsibility and consciousness and at the same time perpetuating the kind of mechanisms that reproduce themselves. I 100% agree and one of the greatest tragedies of the modern environmental movement is how much it has been conflated with ethical consumerism on an individual basis. This is about systemic problems. And as individuals, we can at the margins do things. For example, if you have a community garden, you can get some of your food from that. If you're part of a cooperative that doesn't use plastic packaging, you can get some of your food from that. These are again, my personal experiences. Can't get all my food that way. We just can't do it in Brooklyn. Um, so you're always tied to these systems. And this, and I'm going to repeat something that Anna, just, Anna said, is we're part of these systems, we're implicit in these, thinking through who is working at the various phases in these systems. How do we develop alliances with them? How do we support them is, I think, the best way forward in terms of, A, actually getting things accomplished, but B, also not having this individualist isolationist on we about it. So for example, recycling in New York is really interesting because there's a deposit fee on cans and bottles, which helps collect more cans and bottles, which again, if this is your interest, this is a, a good thing. One of the interesting sociological dimensions to this in New York is that immigrants and poor African-American labor will go from bin to bin and collect them so they can go to a scrapyards or even just reverse vending machines and feed hundreds and hundreds of cans and bottles uh, into the system to get money back. Um, and sometimes sanitation departments go, oh, they're taking money out of the system. Whereas I say, this is great for these people who are doing this in terms of this is income. But there's not a whole lot of advocacy for canners, uh, as they're known here in New York, though there are collectives now, and in, in my neighborhood, there's a collective called Sure We Can that advocates for the rights and the health of these workers. So thinking through, Christina, what wastes are being generated uh, in your immediate area or because of the consumption that you and your neighbors and your family and your friends are doing? And thinking through, can we identify who's having to deal with this how do we reach out to them? Because I'll tell you right now, there's a lot of plastic in my life. And I talk to my industrial design students all the time about how do we stop this? But I'll just give you this. Um, this is an aluminum can, very, very recyclable, but it's not just aluminum. It's also enamel paint. And there's a coating of plastic on the inside of it to keep the flavor of, in this case, seltzer water, but Coke or beer or whatever in there. Um, plastics are incredibly useful materials if you're a corporation with a specific product that you want. In terms of the ecology of the planet, 
It is, as Max Lieberon called, a wicked problem. We're not even sure about how much damage we've already done with plastics. We know it's immense to the individual bodies of humans, other species, as well as to vast ecosystems. Uh, one person thinking for herself can't just solve that, but again, see how, where do the cans go? Who's dealing with them? How can you make common cause with those people can help forward a bit. And again, resistance isn't, oh, we're gonna overthrow the system and everything's gonna be just, we'll fail at a lot of this. We've been failing at a lot of this, but that doesn't mean alliances aren't crucial and continuing to do things well, probably because again, for our own mental health, we need to do that. No. And I'm just rambling here, but thank you for that. No, no. Yeah. Yes, Christina, you're, you're muted. You're still muted. You're, okay, oh. all right, good, good. Okay, so um, thank you. you you're, uh, there's something that, that you said that I think is so right on. And that's like, duh, it's capitalism, stupid, right? That like at the end of the day, the whole thing that keeps us, um, right? The whole fact that I started to feel all the skills and I make what I think are ethical choices, but like I start and I start and, and that is capitalism keeping us in this mm -hmm. mindset that everything is the problem and the responsibility of the individuals. And I'm all for like overthrowing the system. You're right, you're right, right? So I feel like this is an example of the way that our assumptions about the world fall on us invisibly, right? Mm -hmm. And even as like educated critical thinkers, we get confined sometimes by those, right? Because you're absolutely right. It's not mine or yours or yours. It's right. It's our responsibility to, in some ways, like you said, advocate lo low, but also advocate high, right? Oh. Yeah. Thanks. And I'll just. Annie Leonard of Greenpeace wrote the story of stuff. And again, anything I've said here is not original. It's the same thing as ethical consumer, consumerism is a false choice in this. These are structural issues. We're talking about structural racism, structural environmental damage. Uh, and thinking through how we are within those structures is vital because it's not just about choice. Raz, yes. I'll just say that. Uh... That I think that also one of the ways to think about resistance, um, perhaps, is as you both emphasize in your uh, presentations, to think historically and to continue to think historically. And because that's part of the way to start raising new questions, questions that you may not even imagine it currently, or forming new collaborations. Uh, so, you know, at least in the academic world, uh, uh, let's say that. Uh, in this framework, that's one way of resistance, especially as you said, Carl, because the academic world is now under attack, because actually critical mm -hmm. thinking, historical thinking particularly is under attack, it's all the more so uh, resistance. Um, we're at four. Um, uh, I'm happy to take other questions if there are, uh, and if, if Anne and Carl could, could stay. Um, not, um, I want to thank both of you very, very much. Uh, um, I've learned a lot. Uh, there's a lot to think about. Uh, I'm very appreciative of your, of your work, uh, of your time. Thank you for joining us and um, looking forward to continue the conversation in various ways. I'm sure that I'll find other opportunities to bring uh, both of you to talk about your forthcoming book, Anna, and your future work, uh, Carl. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you for the audience joined. Uh, take care, uh, stay safe and healthy. Thank you so thank much. You have, a good, have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.